Tell us your name, what you're running for, and what experience do you have that makes you feel prepared to fill this position? I'm Jeff Worley. I'm running for the Sheriff of Buncombe County. And I have, I'm currently working my 38th year in law enforcement as a sworn law enforcement officer. Let's see, we started back in 1984, went through BLET, went to work in Weaverville, left there, followed my daddy's footsteps to Asheville PD. I stayed there until 99. During that time, I got promoted to sergeant. I wrote a half million dollar grant to put the uh, traffic team together. Had a chance to go through a lot of supervisor schools. Give me a lot of time to work on budgets, policy writing, the different pieces of that, the administrative side. I left there and went to the, the state in 99. I promoted and sent to Hickory. Spent a brief period of time there. Transferred to headquarters at Raleigh on the Highway Patrol headquarters, which gave me another place to work on policies, budgets, the administrative side, even helping with um, you know changing laws while I was there doing that. Spent three and a half years there, went to the training academy, ran the radar program for the Highway Patrol where I kept up with 1,500 people, all of the different parts of their training, conducting it, coordinating it, the policy writing other pieces of that. And came back up here as a first sergeant to Hendersonville in 14, where I uh, district commander over three counties, had 24 troopers, three sergeants, an administrative assistant where I have the day-to-day -day duties of all of that, which falls back under the command level, different parts of that. During the time with the NC State's AOMP, Administrative Officers Management Program, which is the master's level three-month course, did a couple of the FBI's law enforcement executive development courses. So when you put all that together, that's probably the reason that the uh, former Sheriff Van Duncan has endorsed me the former EMS director, Jerry Behan's endorsed me. The North Carolina Troopers Association's endorsed me. And the last Republican candidate we had, Chad Higgins, endorsed me. Great. What are your feelings on the $1.75 million county grant to reduce jail populations, which to some seems to be the root cause of recidivism in the county? Some claim the magistrates won't keep people in jail because of that process. How would you do things differently when it comes to that program? I think what we need to look at is the, the parameters that they use. Is it, is it just a numbers for the, uh, the letting people out? Or are we going to use things from the UCR of violent crimes and stuff? If we're just using a number, and I've got a lot of violent criminals in there, this is a public safety issue to let these people back out on the street. And I, that's the part that we need to look at. My understanding right now is it's just numbers. And if you've got to get down to 175, and everybody from 173 on up are murderers or you know high-level criminals, how do you justify doing that and putting these people back out in society? So I think we need to look at and maybe readjust our parameters on this. You know, I can see where it could be a good thing, but it probably needs a little more adjusted. Is the issue surrounding low bail and the regular occurrence of criminals getting out with a slap on the wrist and general lack of criminalization when it's clearly warranted, in fact, the fault of the magistrate, judges, and DA, or is it truthfully because the jail is short-staffed? I don't want to put the, the fault on anybody really, you know, the magistrates, their, their bonds are set from the, the chief district court judge. They get their parameters. We don't have any say so in any of that. And really it's just, it's not a punishment. It is basically just for, uh, to see if they'll show back up in court. But the things that we're gonna try to do with that, uh, you know, talking about the drug ports and different pieces of that, is, uh, you know, if we can cut off the supply, we can stop some of that. Mm -hmm. And then if we can work on, you know, through education and different things, the different, the mental health places and different stuff that we can do with that, maybe we can cut off the demand to slow down the supply and work both these things together and see what we can come up with that. You know, I want to talk to educate and offer the treatment through the community resources to these low level offenders. You know, I'm going to support the drug court that we already have and see what we can do with that as well. And I'm going to make sure that there's no illegal narcotics entering my detention facility. 
you know, that's that's where a lot of, and you combine all of this together and you support the MAP program and, and ensure that, you know, that the people that we release out in the community, you know, are the ones that should be there. Okay. What do you think is the most effective way to deal with low-level drug offenders? Uh, well, drugs, if you really look at all the crimes that we have, you can relate every one of them back to drugs. If you've got, you know, y'all think about when you come here, you've got to lock everything down to get your weed eaters and everything else secured because it'll be gone and sold for dope by the time you get back home. So we're going to have to work on all of that and work our way around to uh, take care of them. And, you know, we can work our way back up to the high level ones. And I may have got lost on exactly what you're trying to No, that's okay. Low level drug offenders, how would you handle them? Was the question. Well, the. And they're the, the offenders, but we need to get, if we can get them help, to get them from being the offenders, but we also, once again, that's the supply and demand again. We've got to cut off the, the, the supply to them and then see what we can do to get them help, yeah. of whichever way that we have to go with that. What do you see as the most pressing, pressing issues in Asheville and Buncombe County? What are the root causes and how will you make changes to better the safety and crime in our communities, especially considering everyone is so understaffed? Once again, we fall back under drugs. Mm -hmm. So we've got to work at that. And one of my big things that I'm doing, is I'm, re man, I'm, I'm recruiting now, even before, you know, if I make it to the general or get elected either way, I'm recruiting all the time. I was just this week teaching at the BLET program down here at AB Tech. I was recruiting them, trying to see what I can get. And it's, it's build it back, but you gotta build back the, um, the loyalty and the trust in the place to make people, and we were talking about that at, um, at dinner the other day. It's all of us have worked at a place that Friday evening you go home and you feel good. And by Sunday morning, you're sick thinking about having to go back. I never want anybody that ever works for me to feel that way. It's a family, we're gonna treat it as a family. We got a job to do, we got parameters we got to work under. But we're gonna be one family to where, you know, I talk to people that have been there three years and they've never met and talked to the sheriff. There's no way that you can do that. You've got to be part of it. And with that, you bring back that loyalty and, and build it back stronger. Under North Carolina law that governs nuisance areas, are you willing to enforce those laws? Well, what we have to do, we determine where these things are, and we have to get ALE involved. But with, with an impact team that gets out and looks in these areas and looks, we look at our crime stats and see where our problems are, and then we put this impact team together to go look at it, diagnose it, see what it is. And if there's a, we determine there's a need to bring ALE up to speed in this, and then we work everything that we can to support and put together and push this thing on through. I think that speaks to the fact that there are only three people who can write the formal letter to start the investigation, and that's sheriff, chief of police, or DA. Yes. So that's why we yes. asked, you know, if you're a yes. sheriff, you would be willing, if it seemed as if under your investigation, oh, absolutely. it needed to yes. be looked at, yes. you would be willing to do that. Oh, right? absolutely. Can you answer calls inside the city limits? Considering APD has such a shortage, are you willing to have your deputies help city PD answer calls for service if county isn't backed up at the time? Yeah, you know, our number one priority is the unincorporated areas. But that doesn't mean that, you know, you know the mem memorandum of understanding with any of our municipalities inside the county that we will go help. But there's also, obviously, Asheville's the largest one, and as short as they are, certainly we'll come and help and do what we can. But we have to walk that thin line of not leaving our unincorporated areas vacant to come and do that. We have to you know, work together with whatever we have to do, be it, you know, a lot of different um, joint task force things, maybe. Okay, great. Being short staffed at APD and sheriff's departments and losing staff to other places like Henderson County, 
What are you going to do as sheriff to get more deputies on the road and inside the jail? And what is your goal and guidelines when recruiting deputies to work at the sheriff's office? We, one of the things that we talked about just a while ago, building trust back. Yeah. And that starts with me and my staff. We get out and go talk to everybody there. And we're also putting together, you know, if we get out and just meet and go to the different parts, go to the detention centers, go hang out with them, go to roll calls and the different pieces, get out in the public, like I'm doing already, going to BLETs, put together a good recruiting plan. I want to make it to a place to work. Henderson County is calling me going, why are you taking all my people? This is what I'm after. With the shortage in the jail that is requiring road office to work jail and, ma and manning levels being dangerously low, what are your plans on bringing the manning level up to the required state level? That falls back into the building, that trust back mm -hmm. to have people, you know, I've got people calling me just about weekly going, hey man, if you get in, I'll come back. And just different parts of that, I've got several people in other agencies going, if you come, we'll come with you because they know me and my background and being a supervisor of them before. I've got a guy that worked for me years and years ago that's in Chicago. He said, I would fly back and come back down here and work for you. Would you have any, um, any, you know, like incentivizing that you would be doing to make people more prone to want to work in the jails? Because I know that's not always the favorite or the first Naturally, choice, right? And, and the jail is one of the hardest jobs that you'll ever do. And that's, you know, we get a lot of great people that come through and they say, I'll spend a couple of weeks in there and they go, man, this is just not for me. So you have to, and you know, if there's money somewhere, the incentives that we can get to get them to come and do that job, because it's thankless. But the main thing we've got to have, we have to have support for them to know that if they do their job in there, they'll be supported from the top. And we need to let, you know, that crowd in there know that these people are going to enforce the laws against these offenders, but also we're going to hold the officers to the letter with the offenders. And everybody's going to be in here in one cohesive group. How often are you willing to sit down with the leaders of your communities, groups, or neighborhood associations to see what they need and how you can help them? Those are things, and it's hard to put a number on. It's going to be, you know, by case by case. And it may be something that immediately jumps up that the community needs to come and see me. That's where the open door policy comes from. And they're free to do that at any time. Other times it may be things that this impact unit I'm talking about that goes out and addresses needs in the community based on crime stats or the different things that we have from that. Mm -hmm. And then we need to go to a community center somewhere and have a meeting and go, this is the problem that we have out here. This is what we propose to do. And so it's hard to say when exactly they would be, but definitely on as need basis or if something pops up, they're welcome to contact us and we will do everything that we can to come to them. Great. As sheriff, I know listening to your command staff is a big part of your job, but are you willing to sit down with your deputies that work the roads every day and see what they need and what you can do to help them? Oh, that's a no brainer. Yeah. I'm going to be at the detention centers. I'm going to be at roll calls. I'm going to be up and down the hall. I'm going to find out what everybody's doing. You know, what they need, what you want, because it's a family. And if they're your, your family, you really need to be to care about them. One of the things that, um, and coming from the patrol, we had colonel's advisory boards. And they were civilian. And we didn't have a CID, but I'd have a civilian, a CID, a jail, and patrol, and then on the levels, we had uh, advisory boards, and they would meet, and they would talk about their issues, and then once a quarter, once a month, whatever it turned out to be, they come and meet with me and give me these things, and then in a matter of, I think it's 15 days that we had, I had to give them back a written response, and then we met the next time to find out what we did with these, and what are your next ones. So yeah, that's gonna be an ongoing thing continuously. Perfect. Um, and then we'll do this last question and the final thought. So will you institute a fair and open promotion program? Oh, without question. Okay. You know, that's going to be on abilities. It's not going to be on how long you've been here. You know, knowledge, skills, and abilities are the things that get you, and, and personalities. You know, there's a lot of people that can be a truly a, a genius but not be 
a leader. I get the sense that this question comes from uh, some people feeling like there are those that maybe get promotions that aren't necessarily qualified or or it's not their time to be promoted, but they're being promoted anyways. Oh, Therefore, yeah. others are not getting those same treatments, oh, yeah. and it's an issue within the force that people feel like they're not being just, you know, the promotional programs are not working the way that and they should. And, and I've heard that throughout my whole career, places I've been. You know, it's my time, I'm next, this and that. That's not necessarily true, you know, you need to have a set process, you know, and whether you bring in outside assessors or whatever, you have a fair set process to where it's clearly based on that. And you get up, you know, like we did at the city and the state as well. We had blocks and you pick the people out of those blocks, but you weren't really part of setting who was in those blocks. I don't really want to be part of that part. I just want to know when the testing is over, who's my top three. Got it. And what would you like to leave us with as a final thought, or what would you like the voters to know? Oh, and I have thought. And close, and I just want to reiterate, you know, I'm the only candidate that's got 30 plus years of proven full-time sworn experience. And I want everybody else to vet these candidates and see if what they're telling you is exactly what it is. Is it active, inactive? You know, make sure that these times, because I can document 18 of my 30 full time is at a supervisory or command level. You know, uh, and that's really why I'm endorsed by Sheriff Duncan and Chad and Jerry Vion and the Troopers Association. You know, they've they've seen my work ethic. Um, you you've heard my plans and visions to fix these street level issues. We've talked about jail issues, and that's some of the main things that we're going to work on, and recruiting and retention. Without that, we can't really fix the jail issues or have enough people to do the street-level things that we're talking about. So the, the big key, and my question to y'all, is we try to build back trust, is what do you want as the concerned citizens of Buncombe from us in this department? You know, and you can send those things to me at worldlyforbuncombe.com. Well, I think one of the biggest things, at least associated with our group and with those who have come up with these questions is communication, at least to start. Oh, I totally um, when agree. When your leadership is unaccessible, that doesn't make you feel very good. It doesn't make you feel protected. It doesn't make you feel safe. It, that open dialogue is everything to the people that you serve. And so I guess that would be my best suggestion to anyone running for sheriff is you know, listen to the constituents, make yourself available for them because, you know, it's a it's a well-rounded approach, right? Oh, I totally agree. Yeah. I'm going to be not only accessible to y'all, but we've got a system going down there that's not accessible to even their own people. Yes. And we can't do that. And I think that's part of the reason that we're losing the people that we do. We want to make that place, as I talked earlier, a place when you get up on Monday morning going, I can't wait to get back to work because I enjoy what I do and I can get out and work knowing that you know, the upper level has their back and we'll let them go out and work. Perfect. Thank you so much. We yes, appreciate your time. Thank you.